Um, so yeah, my name is Michael Martell. I work at the National Security Archives Cyber Vault Project. I'll go into that uh, on the next slide. Um, I'm going to talk today about Joint Task Force Ares and Operation Glowing Symphony, uh, which was uh, part of the, the campaign to uh, counter ISIS activity online. The National Security Archive, and this is uh, kind of to contextualize our research, um, we predominantly use the Freedom of Information Act and sometimes also the mandatory declassification review process to declassify primary source documents around national security and enable research on these topics. Um, so because of that, I'll be talking mostly from documents that have been declassified through FOIA. Uh, usually when I do this talk, I just kind of briefly scope out what's in the documents and then facilitate a conversation. Um, since I'm not sure how that will work in a virtual format, I'm going to subject you guys to a little bit more of my interpretation. Um, the research that we've done it can all be found uh, at these locations. Um, all the primary source documents are posted up there as well. I would also recommend folks, if they're interested, to check out the panel that Atlantic Council did. Uh, that gentleman there in the Marine uniform is the current number two at Joint Task Force Aries. So that was an interesting uh, discussion. Um, there's also been some really interesting interviews on the topic. Uh, that story on the left is out of Australia, and the other two are out of the US. That's on NPR and Darknet Diaries. So my argument today is a little bit related to a comment Silas made on Monday about how a crisis can force growth and learning in an organization. So in the spirit of crisis con, uh, I'm going to argue that ISIS use of internet services was the crisis that taught or forced US Cybercom to learn uh, how to fight a war in a particular way. Um, I think this is interesting because uh, most of U.S. military experience, especially recent U.S. military experience, is characterized by the repeated scrapping of lessons that were learned in unconventional fights in favor of conventional concerns. Uh, whereas here, U.S. Cybercom is drawing lessons from a non-state fight and looking to apply that to state uh, versus state challenges. Um, so to sort of show my work and the argument on why I think it was so influential, um, it was timed in a really interesting moment during the build out of the Cybercom uh, Cyber Mission Force, the CMF. So the Cyber Mission Force reached initial operational capability in 2016, full operational capability in 2018. Now compare that to the timeline of this campaign, uh, the initial operations order to provide cyber support to Operation Inherent Resolve comes out in March of 2015. Joint Task Force Ares is uh, established in May of 2016. Operation Glowing Symphony authorized November of 2016. So this is a really formative experience for the Cyber Mission Force. The scale of it is also significant. Um, Operation Glowing Symphony, this is uh, from uh, the 30-day assessment of Glowing Symphony, by the way. Um, where Glowing Symphony was cited as the most complex offensive cyberspace operation Cybercom had conducted to date. Uh, and, you know, reminder that Cybercom uh, began in 2010. So that's the time period that they're comparing it to. Uh, I argue that scale uh, taxes organizational processes, if not uh, technical capability. Um, it demands kind of what I conceive of as horizontal capacity rather than vertical capability. Obviously, there weren't any, you know, Stuxnet type uh, intrusions, um, but I, we'll, we'll see later that um, the overall scale, the number of targets, the number of locations, and all the complexities that came with that uh, brought a lot of headaches. Um, just to show you one at this juncture, um, there was so much data exfil going on that um, Glowing Symphony actually struggled to handle and exploit uh, the, the sheer amount of data. Um, so I think that's, that's pretty interesting and telling. And finally, why I think it was so significant um, is you know, the words of Nakasone himself, um, when he got interviewed on NPR Morning Edition, and he said that the Russia small group was um, directly inspired by, or the thinking came from uh, Joint Task Force Ares and Glowing Symphony. Um, something to note uh, was that at the time, uh, Nakasone was the commander of Army Cyber and was dual-headed as the head of Joint Task Force Ares. So this is kind of the baby of uh, General Nakasone. The problem obviously was uh, the way ISIS is operating online. Um, you know, bonus points to anyone if you know who that is on the left. 
Uh, but ISIS had developed a pretty impressive media and propaganda capability. Um, they were showing broad use of social media for media dissemination and recruitment. And they had also conducted doxing attacks against service members trying to uh, inspire or, or incite attacks against, uh, against service members. So in 2015, we get an operations order in support of Operation Inherent Resolve. Um, so it, important to note here that there were other bodies active in cyberspace at this time combating ISIS. Uh, the individual who was on the last slide is Junaid Hussein. Uh, he met an end, met his end related to uh, clicking on a email that compromised his location that occurred uh, in 2015. An interesting uh, point to pull out of this operations order is the global area of interest. That's what the AOI, uh, excuse me, yeah, what the AOI is. And the um, overall mission was to shape or create the conditions to support the defeat of ISIS. Uh, they divided the campaign into two regions. There was uh, what was going on within the OIR theater, so think Syria and Iraq, and then everywhere else, the rest of the world. Uh, Joint Force Headquarters Army was to provide command support. Again, this uh, was Nakasone. And then there was going to be coordination excuse me, coordination with the relevant combatant commands when operating outside of the OIR theater. Kind of break it down a little more specifically. Um, obviously, there's some redactions that are taking uh, some details away from us here. But they're looking to counter ISIS media, support coalition military ops, and then uh, counter sustainment capabilities, which I read as uh, recruitment efforts, um, international finance, illicit finance. And from there, they say they're going to establish a joint task force, which is, of course, Joint Task Force Ares. Out of Joint Task Force Ares, we get the idea for Glowing Symphony, specifically focused on ISIS media functions. Uh, it was to attack the networks by which media is moved from developers to distributors to disseminators. Uh, and they, in their planning documents, included this uh, breakdown or how they saw um, the ISIS media framework and how they were going to target it. What's interesting about these documents is it shows uh, complex coordination being baked into the plan. Um, it's, this isn't really a, a you know, lone agency cowboy operation. This was tied into uh, the rest of the interagency uh, in really interesting ways. Um, I think it's interesting that uh, Cyber Command is obviously a, a, a function of DOD, uh, is talking about coordinating cyber operations as fire support coordination. Um, I think there's sort of an interesting um, path dependency that, that might be at play there. We also see uh, frameworks for the approval of different techniques and tactics. We're seeing, you know, an intelligence gain and loss assessment, which we would expect to see. There's also a pretty significant coalition presence in this as well. Um, I would love to know what's behind that uh, whited out rectangle, but it's interesting to see how many targets were serviced by US and coalition. But I really wanna spend the most amount of time diving into the challenges that were met. Because um, out of those challenges, I think were uh, the lessons that, that Cybercom took out of this experience. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, some pretty strong comments by Ash Carter, uh, specifically pulling out the lines, the intelligence community tended to delay or try to prevent its use, claiming cyber operations would hinder intelligence collection. It's kind of an age-old debate there. Uh, and that the State Department was unable to cut through the thicket of diplomatic issues involved in working through the host of foreign services that constitute the Internet. So a lot of the challenges came from needing to learn how to play well with others. Uh, as we go through these next uh, few documents or selections from documents, we're gonna see lots of references to deconfliction, coordination, needing uh, approval, validation, joint processes. Basically that US Cybercom had to in general hash out problems and mature processes ranging from international coordination to even uh, you know, coordinating internally. So starting on the international side, um, Glowing Symphony immediately started out on kind of a rocky footing uh, because the National Security Council uh, or, or members of the National Security Council filed non-concurs with the plan uh, and sort of forced a series of National Security Council meetings 
to hash out issues over whether or not uh, the U.S. is going to be notifying countries uh, if Cybercom is going to be operating on their networks to root out ISIS media. The initial plan, as I understand it, was that they were not going to give that notification. Um, after the debates at the Security Council, that was reversed, and they were going to give notification. Um, that debate delayed the, uh, the beginning of Glowing Symphony by two months. There was, however, some pretty good coordination between coalition partners. Um, it was so good, in fact, that a plan came up to actually pass aim points or pass targets over to allied partners uh, in cases where for you know, technical or political reasons, it would be easier for them to, uh, uh, to conduct that particular uh, operation. There's an interesting discussion in the bottom left there about whether or not partner deconfliction processes are good enough. Um, and so the recommendation was to develop a memorandum of agreement between these coalition partners uh, to sort of standardize deconfliction uh, processes. Uh, and then from there, they would, you know, then in theory be able to pass on aim points. Uh, this document, by the way, is um, the J3, uh, so the, the operations chief for Glowing Symphony, uh, their after action review. Getting down to the interagency level, um, I, I forgot to put in the PowerPoint, but it is interesting in some documents, especially the planning documents, that Cybercom was actually planning on a lot of these processes being uh, not up to the task, and they were looking forward to sort of giving them the trial by fire and uh, finding ways to uh, refine them. The joint interagency coordination process uh, was one that had already been around for a little bit, but they realized that it wasn't up to that uh, horizontal scope I was talking about, the overall complexity of the operation. Um, it, possibly it was built um, for sort of the, the one-off high-value cyber operations, uh, as opposed to the, uh, this model of sort of a, a low-burn, um, high number of targets operation. Uh, so the 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 Joint Interagency Coordination Group, the JIAC, is meant to enable coordination of uh, various instruments of national power with military operations. Um, so what's interesting here is that um, the, the Joint Task Force, Joint Task Force Ares, was able to pass intelligence or pass information over to other arms of national power. So for example, uh, enabling sanctions pressure, uh, supporting counter messaging campaigns, passing information over to domestic law enforcement for counter recruitment, things like this. There were also challenges in target vetting through the IC. Um, the, the sort of the deconfliction process that was uh, alluded to in Ash Carter's comments, um, and an interesting uh, issue related to an unclear connection between targets and objectives. That's in uh, recommendation one there, I believe. Um, essentially that uh, there, there wasn't really a shared understanding over how certain targets were connecting to objectives, and it was uh, apparently quite difficult to have conversations um, around vetting those targets with uh, other bodies. Political military assessment request, uh, similar to the JIAC process, was also uh, not quite up to the scale. Um, they were also, um, th this issue is also connected to uh, the IC interface. Um, there's an interesting line in here, though, that I think really speaks to Cybercom recognizing that this is the new normal, where they say that given the likelihood that U.S. Cybercom will be conducting more frequent and widely scoped cyber operations in the future, you know, these recommendations. Uh, need, need to be enacted. Operational deconfliction, uh, and this kind of goes to, I guess, how eager it seems Cybercom was to uh, make improvements to their existing processes, where out of this experience, there was a creation of an entirely new deconfliction template. Um, again, this is from the, the J3's After Action Review. Something I find particularly interesting, and this kind of ties back to the earlier observation about you know, cyber as being a form of joint fires and, and what sort of um, you know, institutional roots uh, are there, um, where the applying DOD joint targeting to cyber operations and joint targeting doctrine. Um, 
An issue that was found here was there were somewhat redundant vetting processes between a combatant commander and U.S. Cybercom. Uh, essentially, they had to go through similar processes that added time to the request, um, and that you know produced difficulties um, and and potentially could have deterred combatant commanders from requesting Cybercom support on targets. Um, this actually comes from a different batch of research, but I like pulling it in. Um, so at around the same time as the counter ISIS campaign, the U.S. Cybercom JIOC, uh, Joint Intelligence Operations Center, I think, uh, was discussing joint targeting doctrine and cyber operations. I think this particular briefing uh, was briefed to the DOD's Defense Science Board. Um, it's a fascinating read beginning to end, and I recommend finding it and reading it. But for today, I want to highlight the last slide, Targeting Way Ahead where they recommend incorporating lessons learned from the counter ISIS fight into DOD doctrine, specifically Joint Publication 360 and Combined Joint Chiefs of Staff Instruction 3162. Um, remember, this is occurring as Glowing uh, Symphony is spinning up. For them at this point to be recommending that lessons learned out of this fight should be impacting Joint Publications, Joint Chiefs of Staff Instructions is a pretty big deal. There was also a certain amount of multi-domain coordination that seems to have worked fairly well. Um, although, again, looking behind the, the black boxes would tell us more, hopefully someday. Um, but specifically, there was coordination with offensive operations in Mosul. I don't think it takes that much of a leap in imagination uh, to think that uh, Glowing Symphony, while targeting um, producers and disseminators of propaganda, uh, in cyberspace, we're also coming up with information that could have been used for kinetic targeting by the joint force in Mosul. Um, an example of how that could have looked, again, pre-Aries, but uh, the way Junaid Hussein was killed. We also had an uh, interesting uh, you know, little bout with internal coordination issues. Um, version control on mission planning products was apparently an issue. Um, I think that, so, that speaks somewhat to uh, overall maturity of their planning process and ability to operate at that scale. There's also a really interesting chapter in this. Um, you know, I realize that this page is almost entirely redacted, but I'm gonna pull out a couple little phrases here. Um, where US Cybercom continues to analyze reporting to codify the degree to which the adversary exploited this opportunity. Now, everywhere else in these documents, ISIS is referred to as ISIS or ISIL. So when I see the adversary here, I come to the, I come to the thought that uh, someone else has gotten involved. There's a, there's a third player going on here. Um, and all sorts of theories can be thrown back and forth, and I like theorizing about this, over what exactly occurred here. Um, it could have been ad, uh, the adversary was collecting against U.S. operations on ISIS targets. If you put yourself in the position of Iran or Russia, you know that the U.S. has, uh, you know, obviously expressed interest in ISIS. It's been declared that they're going to be dropping uh, cyber bombs at one point. The ISIS networks aren't particularly well defended. That might be a tempting target to establish a presence on and watch what Cybercom does. Also a potential, there is information leakage from partners. Obviously there was a lot, um, a lot of groups and countries involved in this. Um, and I am more than happy to entertain further theories. Um, specific third party risk though, or specific instance of third party risk, um, Again, not entirely certain whether this was Joint Task Force Ares, but it was certainly part of the counter ISIS campaign, was uh, the slingshot issue, uh, where Kaspersky issued a report on the slingshot APT, and then, oops, uh, the slingshot APT was a US intelligence gathering operation against ISIS, oops or not oops, depending on who you ask. So the results of the operation. Um, as I mentioned, Joint Task Force Ares is still going. Um, so and obviously there's uh, no reason to expect that um, cyber operations against ISIS or terrorist groups more broadly have, you know, been pulled off the table. It's, it, we would have to assume they're continuing. Um, I know Glowing Symphony came to an end, at least under that name. Um, I'm not sure exactly when that occurred, but I do know that it's, there is no longer an Operation Glowing Symphony to my knowledge. Um, and the after action reviews though, and again, it's, we have to keep in mind here that this is US Cybercom grading their own homework. Um, so all, uh, you know, 
all, all appropriate framing to that. Um, but they were saying that uh, the way that they were approaching the evaluation was with two frameworks. One was to determine whether a specific task was accomplished, uh, whether access was achieved, whether uh, a disruption uh, occurred as planned. And the second one that I think is more interesting is whether or not the task had the intended operational effect. Uh, there were some assessment difficulties. It's hard to tell exactly what's going on in this passage, but it sounds like uh, redundancies within the ISIS media network made it somewhat difficult to uh, assess the impact of specific cyber operations. So for example, uh, if multiple um, if multiple members of ISIS were you know fulfilling a similar role, one of them uh, was a subject of a cyber attack, whereas the other one was maybe killed in Mosul. Uh, around the same time, it would be hard to tell which uh, which one was the most impactful on the network uh, or what effects came from uh, one measure or the other. Um, it is interesting to me that the intelligence community was queuing collection to measuring the impact of Glowing Symphony. Um, and it, it, initially I thought maybe this was just going to be a particular say close cousin of Cybercom, uh, but this document says all U.S. intelligence agencies were highly attuned to the OGS plan and postured to focus collection assets to gauge the impact. So I found that fairly interesting. Um, with those issues in mind, uh, U.S. Cybercom assessed that OGS had Im imposed time and resource costs, and this is something we've heard uh, from a few different sources. Um, and then uh, Let's see, at the bottom of that document is then uh, the line that U.S. Cybercom assesses that OGS successfully contested ISIL in the information domain. So Cybercom's feeling pretty good at this, about this one. Um, and to be honest, I think that is a big part of why we got these documents through FOIA. Um, so to kind of wrap up, and I think I've done the same thing Alex did, which is use not enough of my time, but I do see some questions, so we can dive into those. Um, that this experience sort of taught U.S. Cybercom, or at least helped U.S. Cybercom, mature processes for operating in a way that tied into international and interagency bodies for maximum pressure. I think that's something we're likely to see again, uh, particularly um, we, we've seen it through the Russia Small Group, um, and I would imagine uh, if there's something stood up uh, around the COVID issue, I would imagine I would imagine we would see something similar there as well. Um, were they, they were also providing intelligence and shaping functions in support of kinetic operations as a military command. That's obviously important. And uh, this is the first time we've seen that function uh, officially acknowledged and, and um, demonstrated. And then also refining that target selection and approval process, um, having that opportunity to uh, feed lessons back to overall DOD targeting doctrine. Um, but overall, I think the kind of the bottom line capability that was demonstrated or um, learned was the ability to be operating simultaneously against many targets in many countries. Um, the ability to navigate the political relationships and the political issues that uh, arise there, and then the manage to uh, or the, excuse me the opportunity to manage operational complexities at scale on everything from you know, a version control of planning documents and whether or not you have enough hard drives to store your data, all the way up to, um, you know, working through uh, targeting at scale. So that's what all I have today. And I do think I rushed through that a little bit, but I think we've got some time for questions and answers. We certainly do. Um... I don't know if you want to, I'll, I'll read it out loud just for the recording's purposes, but uh, have you seen any indications that Cybercom's operations aimed at countering Russian influence in 2020, such as the deterrence text to Russian intelligence personnel, or attempts to apply the same TTPs from the Glowing Symphony model to operations against a state target set as opposed to a non-state target set? So the most specific we've gotten is, has been Nakasone's comments that the Russia small group was based off of Joint Task Force Ares. Um, we were, I think, somewhat close to getting uh, some documents on uh, what Cybercom was doing around the 2018 midterms. Um, and then a certain article hit the New York Times about us attacking critical infrastructure. And uh, the request that was in final review suddenly went back to three more rounds of Joint Chiefs review. And then I had it denied completely outright. So thank you, David, for screwing that one up. Um, 
Uh, you're not the only one to say that to him. So, <laughs> yeah, um, so I, I wasn't pleased about that, um, but hopefully someday they'll they'll come out again. Um, as far as 2020, I wish I knew. To be honest, that is. Um, not quite within the time frame that FOIA is particularly effective. Um, I would I would look to you, you guys on the more technical analysis to tell me that. Um, but the like I said, uh, they've specifically said and acknowledged that Russia Small Group was based on this. So I think it'd be pretty safe to assume that yes, the similar uh, mode of operating um, could be and probably is being applied to Russia, just minus the you know kinetic operations coordination. Understood. So I actually have a question or, some, or something if you could speak to a little bit. So looking at Glowing Symphony and Task Force Ares and this entire mission, I think one of the things that you highlighted repeatedly and correctly was the importance and significance of cooperation and coordination with different stakeholders considering that infrastructure was hosted in third parties or yeah. in non-combatant areas. So as we're moving between both what Cybercom has said explicitly and then sort of endorsed by the Cyber Solarium report towards more of a persistent engagement to fend forward, do you think that the lessons learned from uh, Glowing Symphony help that effort by showing that there are possibilities for coordinating this sort of activity or instead provide a caution that some of the activity that we're taking from a more offensive action jeopardizes the cooperation necessary to actually execute in this space? I mean, a little bit of both, right? Um, I, what I find interesting about Glowing Symphony was that, um, you know, we're, we're learning about this through documents, but there, there's no you know, specific intrusion or a, an action on a specific target that's become, you know, a case study for this. What this really was, was empowering sort of this all of nation, you know, a multiple arms of national power pressure campaign. And I think that's what they're looking to take into persistent engagement to fend forward. Um, so the, the, as I approach it that way, and you always hear folks saying, oh, you know, we need less coordination because it slows targeting. We can't work fast enough. Um, but I think the coordination uh, was shown to empower what the actual strength of an operation like this is. And by modeling that and being able to leverage that through persistent engagement, defend forward into working with coalition allies, um, I think that was definitely demonstrated. But there, there were issues that came out of it um, on the, the coordination side. I just haven't seen again, that many specific um, objections from, uh, at least not publicly. Um, if they had gone forward with the plan as initially outlined before National Security Council forced the change, I think we'd probably be seeing a lot more of that. Um, it, it'll be interesting to see um, how many more of those issues come out when we're talking about nation states. Um, obviously, you know, we, we've seen that the U.S. and Europe don't exactly change or don't exactly share a risk assessment of China. Um, so how Defend Forward works, you know, we've already seen this with Huawei in terms of how nations choose to interact there. Um, I, I could see future potential for disagreement. I don't think there was a whole lot of disagreement, though, that ISIS YouTube channels and social media accounts needed to get next. Yeah, that's a very good point in terms of, you know, having a, you know, it's like video games, you're either killing aliens or Nazis, like uh, terrorists, we can all kind of agree on that. Yeah, and, and to be honest, I think that's another reason why uh, Joint Task Force Series documents have come out. Um, you know, cyber operations can be fairly controversial, but no one really complains when you hack a terrorist. Interesting observation. Okay, any other questions? 